Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome and thank you for attending the 25th Bell R. and Joseph H. Braun Memorial Symposium, and specifically for joining our panel discussion on sustainable energy futures at UIC. I'm Elizabeth Coach, Director for Partnerships and Strategy for UIC Energy Initiative, Adjunct Professor in Urban Planning and Policy, Faculty Fellow at UIC, an affiliate member at Discovery Partners Institute, and a founding member of the Illinois Center for Urban Resilience and Environmental Sustainability. I will be the one moderating the sustainability, Sustainable Energy Future panel this afternoon and have two outstanding colleagues from UIC College of Engineering joining me today to introduce you to the energy work that is a critical part of our education, research, and outreach missions at UIC. I would also like to take this, this opportunity to thank Celeste Hammond and the others at UIC John Marshall Law School, Center for Real Estate Law, for organizing the entire event today and including us in this important dialogue. For those of you who are just joining the event, the Bronze Symposium is an opportunity to take an interdisciplinary look at how advancing sustainability can help address issues of climate change. The goal of the symposium is to showcase research and work to advance sustainability, how it is shared with students and stakeholders outside of the UI system, and how it can serve as a catalyst for more interdisciplinary collaborations. I would like to provide a little background. Oh, I didn't share my slides, I'm sorry. Let me do that quickly. Um, here we go. I would like to provide a little background first on, on why a discussion around energy is critical. Nope, I'm sorry, this is the wrong slides. <laughs> this is the correct slide. No. Give me a moment, I'm sorry for this. It is pulling up the wrong slides for me. I'm not sure why it's pulling up the wrong slides. Give me a moment while I find the slides. So um, <laughs> I will do an introduction in just a minute. I'm sorry for this, my slide. Oh. I'm sorry. Hi, everybody. I'm Hi, Alex. Celeste. Thank you for, Hi, for How are you? jumping in. Hi, my Marge. slides are not coming. Hi. Hi. I have two sets of Hi. slides, and they are not coming up um, for some reason. Take your time. And Bethany Price is the, the best post here. She'll help us out if there are any problems. And yeah, I will go I asked her if now. she could see both of them, but they were not showing up. Um, let's see. OK. This is the one I want. OK. Can you see Can it I now? No. No. OK, hold on. You might have it on a different desktop. Or I didn't put it on a different it. desktop. That's why I kept everything on this one. Okay. No, I mean, on your own computer, you can have a different. There it is. Yeah. All right. Thank you. There it, is. Okay. <laughs> it did disappear when I stopped sharing it from before. That's what it was. Okay. So yes. I'm so yes. sorry for that delay um, because when we were testing it, it was all there. So <laughs> once again, I want to uh, provide a little bit of background on why discussion around energy is critical for everyone. Um, it has been a chaotic year with COVID-19 causing more disruption than any other event in recent history, not only for public health, but also for the global energy system. Although global emissions are projected to bounce back slower than after the 2008 financial crisis, a sustainable recovery is long way off. What remains to be seen is whether responses to this upheaval will help or hinder efforts to accelerate clean energy transitions and reach international energy and climate goals. When it comes to energy, the harmful impacts of coal, oil, and gas extraction, energy production, and energy waste are harder to recognize than other sources of environmental degradation, such as plastic waste. But out of sight should not mean out of mind. Not only does the natural world continue to suffer from the human practice of burning fossil fuels, but vulnerable communities, both globally and locally, continue to face public health challenges. According to a 2019 study from Harvard University, 1.37 million cases of lung cancer will be linked to reliance on coal-fired power plants in 2025. A 2012 report from the NAACP and El Viejo show that the average income of the 6 million people who live within three miles of coal plants 
around the United States have an average per capita income of $18,400 per year. Of those people, 39% are people of color. It is clear the clean energy transition is happening with the continued growth of inexpensive, clean, renewable sources of electricity and new technologies to serve our growing demands. However, for this transition to provide equitable approaches to the climate crisis, it requires a holistic understanding of our role in energy demand and consumption if we are to accelerate toward a low carbon future that is not only smart, connected, efficient, and clean, but also healthy, equitable, and just. With these thoughts in mind, I would like to thank my two colleagues from UIC for joining us today um, to share their knowledge and expertise on their continuing efforts to achieve a sustainable energy future. The three of us represent different units at UIC and bring a breadth of expertise. We'll be begin with short presentations from each of us in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like to take a moment to introduce everyone. Our first presenter is Professor Farzad Mashayek. Since 2009, he has served as the department head for mechanical and industrial engineering at UIC College of Engineering. During his tenure as head, the department has nearly doubled in faculty size, including a battery faculty cluster and has gained a master of energy engineering program and an international master's program. At the campus level, he has taken a leading role in building and improving an infrastructure for high performance computing and big data. Farzad began his academic career by receiving a National Science Foundation Career Award and an Office of Naval Research Young Investigator Award. In parallel with his administrative responsibilities, he continues to maintain an active research program where most recently he launched a new research effort on solid ion batteries. Farzad is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and an associate fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautic and Astronaut. Astronaut, astronautics, sorry. He will be presenting an overview of MIE, which is the Department Master of, I'm um, sorry, Mechanical and Industrial Engineering, research activities on energy storage and conversion for sustainability. I will be the second presenter. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Director of Partnerships and Strategy for the UIC Energy Initiative and serve as an adjunct faculty in the College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs. I teach courses in energy storage, urban sustainability and sustainable mobility with backgrounds and expertise in architecture, urban planning, policy, stakeholder engagement, human environment, behavior, energy and sustainability. My focus remains on identifying and leading collaborative efforts for curriculum, research opportunities and program pilot development. My recent efforts have focused on a series of workshops and forthcoming report to identify guiding principles for transportation electrification for the state of Illinois. I will be presenting on the UIC Energy Initiative activities that have been built upon our foundational work to strengthen this interdisciplinary community. Our third presenter is Manish Singh. He is an assistant professor of chemical engineering and director of the materials and systems engineering lab at UIC College of Engineering. Before joining UIC, he was a postdoctoral scholar, scholar in the Joint Center for Artificial Photosynthesis at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and UC Berkeley, where he worked on the development of solar fuel generators that can convert sunlight, CO2, and water to transportation fuels. The central theme of his research is to develop experimental and computational tools for the fundamental understanding of materials and systems involved in the synthesis of designer crystals for pharmaceutical applications and solar fuels for energy applications. He has received multiple awards, including the George Cleansing Best PhD Award. He will be presenting on carbon capture and conversion for sustainable energy. For the participants joining us this afternoon, just a quick reminder to please post your questions through the, uh, throughout the presentations and we will get to the questions during the Q&A session at the end. Thank you all again. And we will now begin with Farzad's presentation. Thank you very much, Elizabeth, for the uh, kind introduction. So let me share my slides. This one and going on this. And uh, I also like to first thank Celeste Hammond and uh, other organizers for giving us this opportunity to share our experience and have a conversation with everyone who's attending now. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is to present an overview of some of the research activities in the department. As Elizabeth mentioned, a few years ago, we started a faculty cluster in battery specifically liquid, I mean, solid ion batteries of different types. 
And we hire several faculty throughout the years. We have a strong group right now. They do collaborations with faculty in other departments, including um, in, uh, chemical engineering. So this is just a representative uh, presentation of the, all the activities. I, I want to start with this quote uh, from uh, Maurice Germain, which is a 1969 Nobel laureate in physics. Sustainability means living on nature's income rather than its capital. Uh, so this is really the goal. We need to get there. But this, unfortunately, is not an on-off switch that we wake up one day in the morning and we say, OK, now we are sustainable. So to get to that one, there are things that we need to do and along the way systematically improve until we get to that final goal. So the research activities that we have in the departments uh, comes around this idea that nothing is right now, uh, I mean, not all of them right now might be considered as sustainable, uh, but we need that in order to get to that final goal. The energy storage part, uh, we'll talk about the uh, battery research mainly. And then we talk about also energy conversion in general, primarily from the liquid fuels and also gaseous fuels. How we can, because I don't think for a foreseeable future, we can uh, totally remove our reliance on these type of fuels. We need to have them. So the question is how we can make them more sustainable, uh, renewable fuels, and also how we can make them more efficient and less pollutant. The, the other angle that I have to this is how we can increase our energy efficiency, which I will talk about the center that we have at UIC that goes to industry and does assessment and give recommendation for making their consumption of energy more efficient. From the battery cluster, I just want to show you uh, a couple of samples here, one on the experimental side. This is from the research group of Reza Shahbaz and Yassar, who is one of our senior faculty now. Uh, Reza basically works on all aspects of the batteries. The bat for batteries, everything starts at the atomic level that where you have the uh, structure of the material and you want to study to see how ions can go in there and uh, deposit and or intercalate, uh, the right word is that. And then how you can improve this. If you think about it, the uh, solid ion batteries technology has not really significantly improved. We haven't seen a step change since uh, uh, lithium ion batteries were invented maybe four or five decades ago. We, have, we haven't had a step, there have been improvement, but no, there is no other material right now that can commercially and in an efficient way to do this job. It still is lithium ion to go into graphite. That's what it is. So people, a lot of people are working on this one. So coming up with the bat material is one thing, then you have to actually put it into a, a battery and test it. So the, the, the sequence that you see here is what Reza has set up in his lab along with his collaborators in order to be able to test it all the way at different scales until hopefully gets to the point, point of commercialization. Uh, the materials, of course, is the core of this one. That's where everything begins. The, Many, many research groups are working in this area that the millions, if not billions of dollars are being spent annually on this. There are so many problems uh, to deal with. And in fact, the largest center right now is at Argon JSERC, which is in the second phase. The first five year ended, I think, last year, and then they are in the second phase. The problem is that you fix one problem, something else comes up. So dendrite formation is one thing. Then you have electrical polarization. For instance, if you use silicon, you can store a lot of lithium ions in there, but expands four times and it breaks like, like glass. So because of these problems, you cannot just do a lab test of a small sample of the material and say, okay, this works. You have to take it all the way to the level of how commercialization would work. Uh, related to the work that Reza does, we collaborate a lot together in my group with, uh, uh, with Professor Yorkiv, one of our research system, research system professors. We do a lot of modeling of the batteries. And uh, as, again, this is a multi-scale problem. If you start from the battery itself, then you have the unit cell inside the unit cell. You are dealing with the scale of micrometers. And then you go down to the particle size, which is a nanometer. And then inside that, is the, battery level, the material level, you have to really work with 
atom level, which is angstrom. So you cannot do all of these in one simulation. You have to do this so-called multi-scale modeling that you start from the bottom and you work your way up. This is what we're doing in our group. We work very closely with the Resus group as well. The, this is another example of what we do. This is one case that we did for dendrite growth, as you see on the left side. Dendrites could grow, especially if you have just lithium uh, batteries, which is only lithium itself. It's very efficient, uh, high capacity, but unfortunately dendrites will grow very fast and they grow and then you get a short circuit and everything fails. What we have been doing this, doing simulations at different levels. And even recently we are also implementing artificial intelligence or machine learning methods in order to be able to more efficiently and quickly give results. Now on the other the aspect of this one, talking about uh, what we can do with liquid fuels, uh, uh, of course, fossil fuels are enemy number one here. Uh, we don't want to even mention the name, but the fact is that they're here. They're gonna be here for quite some time. So the Ken Berzinski's group is looking at different alternatives, for instance. For instance, natural gas is a much better uh, fuel. Uh, you can't use it for transportation as much, but for power plants and other stationary, purposes is very useful. Uh, the problem is that it's burning. Uh, and the good thing is that if you, when you burn natural gas, the CO2 generation is less. And then for the study, uh, the product, I mean, the Kemmerzinsis group studies the product distribution of the oxidation of energy from different sources. The other fuel that they're considering, alcohol to jet fuel, the, the good thing here is that the alcohol comes from uh, petroleum, not uh, from agricultural products, but you want to convert this into petroleum type fuel that you can use it in existing uh, devices that you have. So that's another thing you can come up with a new fuel, but it has to work with what you have. You cannot go around and retrofit everything in the world in order to be able to use it. And he also works on uh, hybrid systems, uh, which includes combination of both batteries and uh, the regular engines that you have internal combustion or gas turbine type of engines. Uh, now, I want to just to show, I don't want to be very technical, but just to show you that uh, how Ken does his research. This is the room full of one equipment, it's called shock tube. And what it does is that it uh, generates one tiny area that uh, probably just in this area that generates a very high temperature and high pressure. And at that point, can injects a tiny amount of fuel and then he collects all the gases in this gas chromatograph and measures basically what kind of gases are coming out. So if it's CO2, CO or other things. And then he does some uh, modeling of this one, which can be used for simulations as well. Another, uh, our faculty who also collaborates closely with Ken Brzezinski is Patrick Lynch. Uh, Patrick uh, works on new biofuels, another alternative type of fuel, which I definitely add to sustainability. Uh, you must have heard of ethanol, biodiesel, and other types of fuels. So uh, one critical issue with the new these fuels is how they ignite. So ignition properties are very important. And for that one, uh, Patrick Lynch also uses shock tubes, but with smaller shock tubes and studies the ignition of these fuels. So combined with what Kemmerzinski does, it would show what type of fuels would be useful. And my group does uh, significant simulations of this large scale uh, simulations. This is just one example of a high, for high uh, supersonic combustor for hypersonic flights, which we're working on a project for uh, DOD. Uh, and just as so we can predict uh, when you inject the fuel, what kind of products you will get and how you can sustain the flame for this type of, this type of devices. The last one I want to talk about the energy efficiency, as I mentioned, uh, where the, the Department of uh, Energy has uh, a division of energy efficiency and renewable uh, energy, uh, ERE, and they support uh, several around 30 centers around the country, as you can see on this map, which call industrial assessment centers. What these centers do they form teams, mainly of students. They send them to various industry. They do audits of their uh, energy consumption and give them recommendation on how they can improve. And as you can see overall for the centers, there have been around 19,000 assessments so far. And they give around 143,000 recommendation. And the average saving has been around $137,000. 
And at UIC, uh, we have done in this cycle, which we are in the fifth year and we will go up for renewal this year. We have done 24, 241 assessment and we made around 2000 recommendations. So these are, this is again another aspect that eventually will contribute to sustainability if you reduce the reliance on uh, energy, which is right now mainly on uh, liquid fuels. So with that, uh, I will end here. And uh, I think Elizabeth, you're uh, next, correct? I stop sharing. Yes, thank you so much, Farzad, for your great presentation. It's great to see so much of the work that is happening. Um, let's hope the, the correct presentation gets shared this time. Um, and it looks like it is. Okay, so let me go into full screen mode. Great, okay, so thank you again. Um, so just to, to, I'm sandwiched between two engineers. I'm just gonna warn you, <laughs> warn everyone ahead of time. And so mine is not very engineering based. And so, um, so it'll be an interesting uh, panel today. So energy is a basic human need, right? Energy is critical for society. It's a backbone for the way we live. In many ways, it's the lifeblood of our modern society. Without it, we don't have food, water, transportation, access to healthcare. Um, and humans certainly are not gonna change their desire for energy um, to support the mo their modern lives. We're not gonna say we don't need energy. We're not gonna say we don't need our technology. We not only want it, but we want more of it. And so um, for this reason, the urgency of tackling emissions uh, remains. So regardless of the challenges, net zero emissions is increasingly the desired outcome sought globally. Um, there's been an ambitious pathways mapped out by lots of different countries um, to hit net zero targets on time and in full. However, to achieve 40% emissions reductions by 2030, 75% of global electricity generation would need to be from low emission sources by 2030. In 2019, there was less than 40% globally. Um, so this would mean an over 35% increase is needed over the next 10 years. Net zero emissions by 2050 would also mean increasing sales of passenger electric vehicles um, from the 2.5% in 2019 to more than 50% worldwide by 2030. Failure to mitigate these problems will cause irreversible damage to the entire planet. Um, under current policy scenarios, the world is certainly not set for such a pivotal reduction in emissions. Um, and if so stronger policies are not endorsed, emissions um, can fall. So if they, we do look at um, some more sustainable policies, then we can fall to zero, perhaps by 2070. So with the current global 2050 net zero assurances and China's 2060 net zero goals, this allows progress toward that goal, but it only gets us part of the way. And so this is, this is um, a really one of the big challenges that we're looking at. So to reach that net zero by 2050, massive efforts are needed, enact, needed to be enacted over the next decade. Um, this would include electrification, energy efficiency, innovation and advances in technology, and ultimately changes in human behavior. These are all parts of the energy ecosystem that need to be in place simultaneously. So not just one at a time. There's a sustainable recovery plan that was recently proposed by the International Energy Agency, and it supports the rapid growth of solar, wind, and energy efficiency technologies. It embraces a post-crisis path to net zero within the next 10 years. And it also requires major investments and scale-up efforts for hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage, and a renewed momentum for nuclear power. So these are all um, things that we need to achieve when it comes to new developments research technology. Now, in order to prepare for this energy transition, we need to understand the outcome of our energy conundrum, which is our emissions. Um, so let's talk about that, uh, our, our byproduct of our modern lifestyles, carbon emissions. So they appear to have been peaking um, at one point, but it continues to rise and as, as a, is a direct correlation to our energy use as a society. So emissions will continue to increase over time. We're gonna to return to pre-COVID-19 levels in just a few years. Therefore, we require clear and economical pathways for clear, clean zero emitting energy sources. So the work of the UIC Energy Initiative focuses on achieving a more sustainable energy future through a broad foundation in energy and sustainability and convergent efforts around energy storage. The mission of UIC Energy Initiative is to inspire and cultivate minds of current and future decision makers to pursue a sustainable energy future through innovative research and development to advance sustainable technologies, practices, policies, human environment behavior synergies, and educational and co-curricular programming. So the UIC Energy Initiative, as you can see, is a small group 
Dr. George Crabtree serves as our director and also as director of the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research at Argonne National Laboratory. Thomas Elaine is the program coordinator and he runs two of our prestigious summer programs. And as I mentioned, I'm director for partnerships and strategy where I bring years of interdisciplinary and environmental expertise in relationship building, partnership engagement to grow UIC's energy and sustainability network programs and impact. So just to quickly show you a small example of our partners, collaborators and network um, that are included on this list of slides. There's many more that I, I did not include on here, but over the 11 years that the UIC Energy Initiatives launched, launched a number of UIC and non-UIC partners across public and private sectors have joined our efforts. Just to highlight some of our work over the years, Dr. Crabtree continues to lead and advise on a number of research efforts around energy and energy storage. As you can see, the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research is, is one of our key partners. We do have an energy research group that has been around the entire 11 years, and we continue to um, have discussions and dialogues on how to, to push the, the energy research um, efforts in, um, at UIC. The Electrochemistry Collaborative is another one that grew that was across a number of different units and colleges, and um, out of that came the Water Energy Nexus as well. Um, Thomas, um, he, he's in the top right there with his two summer programs, SIZE, which provides interdisciplinary perspective on energy and sustainability, and then ENGINE, which is led by a prestigious advisory group of electrochemistry researchers to provide high-level training for PhD students, postdocs, and early career professionals. And then my work is, is very um, different. Uh, it's on enhancing UIC's urban mission, strengthening its energy and sustainability programs, and engaging students to solve real world energy and sustainability problems. I foster local to global sustainability and energy communities to identify, strategize, and achieve energy and sustainability goals, and ultimately to pursue um, coordinated and collaborative initiatives, engaging peer and institutional partners and networks. As you can see, a lot of my work focuses on things that curriculum that's directly related to UIC's energy and sustainability efforts. There are also beyond this co-curricular program um, where students focuses on energy, environment, sustainability have been highlighted. There is partnerships within UIC for courses and degree programs. And a lot of my recent efforts in, um, in uh, transportation electrification, sustainable mobility have been emerging. And um, with recent um, endorsements from the Illinois Clean Air Now on my transportation electrification infrastructure workshops that I held across 2020. So our work remains critical to a sustainable energy future. And there's much we can learn from previous energy transitions, which continues to inform our work. I'd like to share some of those mission critical ideas that continue to motivate our efforts. Um, so what can we learn from, from what's happened um, from solar success, for example? Let's take a look at disruptive technologies. So today's disruptive technologies and digital strategies have upended historic 50 year timescales of transitions in energy sources, carriers and impacts, clean energy, sustainability targets and consumer parents paradigms continue to be urgent considerations um, for climate change. Uh, and so transportation and the electricity grid are already experiencing transitions to cleaner and more sustainable operations that are driven by advanced technologies such as electricity storage, digital revolutions, including big data and blockchain and consumer preferences, such as mobility services and personalized energy informatics. Electrification when paired with the vigor of the digital and data era are accelerating opportunities to materialize energy transitions for transportation and the grid and their respective roles in a decarbonized future. So one energy transition to look at is solar, what can we learn from solar? Um, solar will play and continue to play a, a central role in transitioning to a decarbonized future. Supportive policies and maturing technologies are making solar PV consistently cheaper than new coal or even gas fired power plants in many regions, with some solar generation providing the lowest cost electricity in recent decades. There's much to be learned from that success. So although the costs for renewables have been falling over the last decade and continue to fall, they're not without their own set of challenges. One critical weakness of renewables is intermittency. The wind doesn't always blow and the sun doesn't always shine. So this is where energy storage comes in. When renewables are paired with storage, it adds more value to the overall system and costs fall faster together. So storage costs also have decreased considerably and will continue to do so as you could see from this chart. In fact, 
um, they're falling faster than, than they have for renewables. The main reason for this faster drop in cost is that demand for storage continues to increase. Now the US transportation sector is ripe for transformation through electrification. With, within the transportation sector itself, 90% is attributed to petroleum usage. So why should we focus efforts on transportation electrification and where should we focus them? As you can see, some of the four energy consuming industries, transportation, electrification, residential and commercial are already electrified while others are not. The entire transportation system is lagging behind. Within transportation, light duty vehicles um, represent 55% of energy consumption and are the largest energy consumer. Passenger cars can provide the greatest opportunity to provide clean and electric transportation and to partner with a net zero grid of the future. But other transportation emitters need solutions too. It's not simply our passenger cars. So even though the cost challenge for transportation electrification is dissipating, different subsections within transportation have different costs. The cost for infrastructure is much higher as we look at medium and heavy duty vehicles. And so the entire transportation sector faces considerable challenges to achieve net zero emissions and batteries will only serve part of the transportation sector, not all of it. So this is a huge consideration when we're looking at um, the future of energy. So action to decarbonize transportation is required through the development of alternative clean fuels, not just batteries, for vehicles where batteries cannot provide immediate solutions themselves. So how will transportation electrification impact the electricity sector? Energy consumption trends across sectors show increased electricity demands over time, but not much will change for industry, industrial, residential, and consumer sectors. What we are seeing is the introduction of a new electricity cons um, consumer, the transportation sector itself. The demand for additional new generation of electricity will be coming from transportation, representing a change to electricity demands that require solutions within the next decade itself. So we know clean electrified transportation is critical for the coming energy transition, but getting to net zero clean transportation will be a challenge and requires a multitude of solutions the next generation must provide for this transition to happen. I do wanna point out that transitions can and do happen very quickly. So take a look at this slide and you could see that the parade in, this is a parade in New York City in 1900 and the other ones in 1913. There was only one car among all the horse-drawn carriages in 1900 compared to the one horse-drawn carriage in a, a street full of cars in 1913. In 13 years, there was a complete transition of the transportation sector. This means that actions over the next decade are not only possible, they are achievable. And not only for transportation, but for the entire energy ecosystem, research, collaboration and education of the next generation is critical for continuing a positive transition. So at this point, I'd like to thank you and I will now pass the mic to Manish Singh for his presentation. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let me start sharing here. Brown lecture, share, all right. So I'm gonna talk uh, today about on the dark side of, uh, let me see if it's our presentation view. Are you seeing the presentation view or? Um, it's not presentation view yet, no. It's not? Okay, so I think I have to stop share, go to the other side and then I'm gonna share it again. And here, share, um, should be the presentation view coming up. Still not the presentation view? No, not yet. I don't know how to do this. Um, you, are you in the, have you hit the presentation view in, so slideshow in your PowerPoint? Yeah, but I think that's fine. I can, I can show, yeah, we don't have much time. So, well, I think this is okay. Uh, I can talk more on the on the content rather than the dynamics here. So uh, my topic here is, you know, realizing the dark side of energy transportation and conversion, which is uh, CO2 release and and how we can capture it and convert it um, to make it sustainable is the topic of uh, my talk here. So in in few minutes, next few minutes, I'm going to make this connection between the energy conversion and transportation and the carbon emission. 
I'm going to make uh, you realize how uh, carbon is being emitted at different levels and how we live in a carbon bubble. I'm also going to show you a solution of uh, converting and capturing CO2 um, so that any energy conversion process or transportation process uh, can be coupled with this technology to make it sustainable. And, and finally, I'm going to show you two case studies. A first case study is um, making a sustainable production of uh, power and chemicals. And the second is how you can purify air in your own house. Manish, would you like me to share and just tell me to advance that way? I, I yeah, can... I don't know. Uh, I was not able to, uh, if you can stop, do it. Yeah, stop sharing and I'll do Yeah. Perfect, okay. All right, so can you advance to the next one? Yes, so now I'm gonna talk, uh, give you a brief overview of the use of energy Next slide, please. So we know energy is used widely, uh, you know, there's the generation and distribution and we use it in transportation and production of chemicals and, uh, and the fuel. Uh, so these are the primary modes of energy transportation and conversion. Uh, next slide, please. I think it's not in the presentation mode, but yeah. All right, so this is a energy flow, uh, the US energy flow in 2019, last year. And you can see how in different level, the energy is being consumed by five primary sectors in our society, energy generation, transportation, industrial use, commercial, and residential. And what you see on the right-hand side is the way energy is being uh, um, you know, utilized. One is of course, rendering the services, energy services, and the other, the largest part is the energy rejected, right? Which is again, the thermodynamic limit of the energy conversion process. Next slide. And the important take home message here is in US, in our country here, more than 62% of electricity is derived from fossil based fuels and which constitute 35% from coal and 27% from natural gas, right? And more than 68% of the total energy being consumed uh, or utilized is lost or wasted. And that's essentially because of the Carnot limit or thermodynamic efficiency of the process. And that bottles down to a, a limiting process in all these uh, energy utilization is the combustion. And you can see uh, it is the combustion which drives all these five different sectors. And, and, and it is the primary reason that why you have 68% of energy loss. If you go to the next slide, you will see the reason behind such an inefficient process. This is a, a hist historical view of how we have been evolving uh, in utilizing energy. And, and the starting one, which you see is a biological converter is when we use animals to uh, you know, do the work. And we then gradually move towards Watts engine, then came the Carnot theorem, and then the Grover's fuel cell. And there comes the split. You had this Oswald process and Oswald proposal was, was to build a device for direct oxidation of natural fuel was put forth in, 19, in 1894, but because of inefficient conversion of fuel to electricity, this didn't move forward very well. And then the entire process gravitated towards combustion-based processes where you burn the fuel directly to produce energy because that was quick, efficient, and you can directly use it. And the Oswald proposal went up in you know space uh, application where you know you you were using fuel cells for small scale application and now you know after I think 50 years or maybe 100 years since the Oswald was proposed this process we are at the stage where we can efficiently conduct that that um, you know the, the the technology that Oswald proposed but right now it's too late, uh, too late in a sense that majority of our processes are still combustion-based process. And the, and the downside of that is uh, all the combustion-based process release CO2. Go to the next slide, please. And you can see here, you know, uh, the rise and fall of CO2 level between interglacial uh, uh, inter period. And more towards the right-hand side, you will see how this uh, post-industrial uh, era the CO2 levels are increasing. And that has to do with the way we are using energy. And it's tightly coupled. 
all the rejected energy you know is 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 related to combustion process and because of combustion you have all the co2 being released to the atmosphere and the level of co2 can be seen in the next slide this is the distribution of co2 per sectors and you can see there's a huge similarity between this flow and the energy flow more the energy used in the electricity generation more the co2 will be released and we are talking about about 5 gigatons of co2 released per year and majority is being contributed by the electricity and the transportation so this was in 2018 um 2000 i think uh, the 14 is underneath this uh, but well i wanted to show two slides here it's an animated one 2014 the carbon emission were higher than 2018 and the drop in the carbon emission is primarily because of electricity nowadays many power plants they actively implement carbon capture and and the carbon release from power plants is, is less as compared to 2014. next slide please this is a related uh, uh, slide showing uh, how other greenhouse gases are contributing uh, towards uh, you know the the consequences like global warming uh, co2 is still the primary greenhouse gas which is which is emitted by these uh, energy conversion processes the other one uh, are nox uh, as well as methane coming from agriculture side uh, more but i'm not going to talk more about the other greenhouse gases primarily i'm going to talk about the co2 next slide I'm going to make a few slides here. I, I made it just to realize, you know, how we are living in a carbon bubble and how we are surrounded by, uh, you know, CO2 emission at, at different level. Next slide. So this is a, a, a person who is uh, at the resting stage and breathing in, you know, the air around us is 400 ppm, right, on an average. And when you breathe in, you take 400 ppm, what you release out is 40,000 ppm. And, and if you do the balance in the next slide, one person releases CO2, one kilogram of CO2 per day. And one mature tree, a big tree, um, absorbs CO2 as 60 grams of CO2 per day. So if you want to do a balance, one person, the way uh, the CO2 release is balanced by about 16 trees. Um, and of course, we are not talking about the other emissions of CO2, which is in the next line. And this is a, a crazy view where you see transportation uh, being the major contributor of CO2. And we are talking about active and positive release of CO2 close to 14 million metric tons per day, which cannot be offset by any tree or any natural mechanism. And that's why we need an active mechanism of CO2 capture. Next slide, please. Well, one more slide here showing the different level of CO2, which you know is an eye opener uh, when I saw it for the first time. We live in at a different level of a CO2 environment. The house where I'm, the, I'm, I'm in the office right now, the CO2 level is not 400 ppm. In a closed environment, it can go all the way up to 1,000 or 2,000 ppm. In the bedroom, when you're sleeping, your CO2 level can go to 2,000 ppm and you're still breathing fine. So the concentration of CO2 has nothing to do directly with, with us in terms of you know, the way we breathe. Uh, but it has the other effect, uh, which is a global warming and, and related things, ocean acidification. So this is a very nice uh, uh, distribution showing, you know, how the CO2 levels are very different in different uh, spaces. The, next slide. So we, we do know that we, we need an active mechanism of CO2 capture, and we have to rely on novel technologies to capture CO2, which are at least 10 times efficient than the trees or, or the natural mechanism. However, next slide, the, the rate of CO2 emission is going to increase because the population is going to increase, the consumption of energy is going to increase, it's all tied up together, right? So we have to have a reliability over renewable sources or the other uh, uh, way is you, if you are capturing CO2 uh, for any sustainable energy production, you need to use the renewable energy so that you offset the CO2 emission coming from the fossil fuel based uh, energy uh, consumption process. Next slide. So I'm just going to go quickly. Um, I have a couple of minutes on carbon capture technologies. Next slide. Essentially, this is a closed loop carbon capture society where you know you take CO2 from the air, either you know you absorb it or, or use any any absorbent 
use the absorbed CO2 and make the fuels for the car or the chemicals and the process again releases CO2 and you close the loop, right? Uh, there are many companies working which are listed on the right hand side, Climbworks, Carbon Engineering. These are the companies who are actually deploying this carbon capture uh, technologies. Next slide. This is a very brief overview of four, di three different kinds of technology which is out there for carbon capture. Absorbin, absorption based, adsorption based, and the membrane based. And on the right hand side, you will see different uh, levels of energy consumption per amount per mole of CO2. And uh, the one thing which I want to point out is a membrane based technology, which takes very less amount of energy to capture CO2. And that's what we have. Next slide. My apologies. This is Bethany. We need to start wrapping up soon so that we can start the next scheduled webinar. So this is just a warning. Thank you. Sure. I'm going to show two slides and then um, we can open up Q&A. So this technology that we have developed is a moisture grad gradient process where you have the moisture gradient, which allows CO2 to capture. I'm not going to go into the chemistry. Uh, next slide, but I'll show you something more interesting thing. We have an artificial leaf technology based on this technology, uh, the technology that we have developed. Next slide. I'm going to show you one nice case study uh, of, for sustainable power, power production. So this case study shows how you can sustainably con take the CO2 from the flue gas and convert it to a monomer ethylene, which is required for the plastic production. And, and this, uh, this one, again, relies on the carbon capture technology that we have developed at UIC. We are working with uh, Amin Salehi at, U at MIE uh, to, to deploy it. Next slide. Uh, this is, again, the details of how this, uh, this prototype looks like, which can continuously capture and convert CO2. Next slide. Home air, air purifiers are pretty cool. Next slide. Um, this is essentially showing, showing that we are actively working to make a novel purifier where, which, which can capture CO2 um, using a humidification system. So you imagine that you have a humidifier in your house. This humidifier will humidify your house as well as capture CO2 using our technology. So it has a again, broad, broad application. I think that's it I have. Next slide. Yes, so the take home messages are, you know, uh, what I summarized. So I think we can do q and I don't know how much time we have left. I've tried to do it in, in eight minutes. There are, there are three minutes remaining and then we'll have to wrap up. Just sure. to Great, thank you. Thank you, Manish, for that great presentations from everybody. Um, I believe there's some questions maybe that have been posted. Nope, looks like. I, I um, see a question from uh, Celeste. Oh, yes, yeah, you put it in the chat. Um, right. How optimistic are you that the many things needed to be done will be identified, recognized, and done? Identified, they're already identified. Recognized depends on your, your political views. Um, done, it depends on funding and um, efforts on from private sector involvement. So it's a collaborative effort. It's, it can't be done one off. Like I said, everyone has to have hands on deck for the next 10 years to really make it happen. Um, so, so that's, uh, there's my quick response. I want to, I do want to ask a question of Farzad and, um, and Manish though, about um, when we think about, I want to go into the opportunities part as opposed to the challenges perhaps. And so within your own field, what do you see as the biggest opportunity for that clean energy future? Um, and, and how can we best leverage what we, what we know and what we have? Is that? Uh, you want me to go first? Yeah, I think uh, I think that, that one of the biggest opportunities is really in energy storage because if you don't resolve this one, uh, you cannot deal with intermittency of mo all of these different sources that you're talking about. Wind energy, you mentioned it, and the also uh, solar energy. Everything these are intermittent, come and go. Even hydro. So we need to resolve this, and there is an opportunity there. Unfortunately, it's very stubborn. It hasn't cracked yet. But we are hopeful with all the energy, with all the uh, resources that are pouring into and eventually. Will. But I have to second what you said, Elizabeth, again. The, 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 everything to get done, you need a three legged stool. Well, one is the science, the other one is the policy, the other one is the market. Unfortunately, we don't have the policy right now backing these things up. And that's the problem. Excuse me, sorry, we're, we're at that time. I thank the panelists and the attendees for attending. And if you wish to attend the next scheduled uh, panel, you can find it in the chat. Thank you so much. Thanks. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.